thank you for joining us. Uh, we will have uh, additional participants joining in, but I think we can we can already start. So welcome to our Recreating Europe webinar on the regulatory landscape for copyright content moderation, evaluation and future trajectories. So as you can guess, this is part of our Recreating You project, which is funded by Horizon 2020. And more concretely, part of Work Package 6, which is a work package with many of us are presenting today that uh, joins teams from Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Saget in Hungary, and also uh, Berlin, now, now Bremen. Um, and it focuses on the issues, legal and empirical issues around copyright content moderation in Europe. And today we'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of our research, but also of the current status quo, as this is a very much evolving reality in Europe. Now, before we start some house rules, the webinar will be recorded, as you know. So for those of you that do not want to be show up in the recording, please turn off your camera. Also make sure to mute your mics uh, during the discussion. And if you wish to post questions or participate, and there will be ample space for that, please write the questions in the chat. So we'll make sure that we group them and they're read, and maybe there's even a possibility to, to read out uh, some of the questions. Now, that's the essential part. As for the program today, we will go first, I, I'll give you a brief introduction and background on the regulatory framework of copyright content moderation at EU level. And then we'll have two substantive panels. The first one of mapping national implementations of Article 17 of the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive, the CDSM Directive. And this panel will be moderated by Peter Metzay. And we'll also have participations from Yelena Yaromi, Kaspar Salek, and Julia Priora. And we'll talk about the situation, current situation in Hungary, Germany, Sweden, and Italy. And maybe there's other examples coming out uh, during the discussion. And then panel two will be more of an evaluative panel and where we're thinking about future looking, right? What's to come in your copyright content moderation? And there we'll have two intervention, interventions by Sebastian Felix Schremer and Thomas Ries, and then a, a reaction and a discussion with Julia Reda. So we're very thankful to all the participants. And then in the end, uh, we also have Thomas Ries with the closing remarks. So uh, we just, first, I want to thank all the participants uh, that, that agreed to speak in this seminar. And you all have their bios in the website, and we'll send you all the slides afterwards, and also the link to the recording that will be made available in the Recreating EU. Um, channel on YouTube. Now, going on to the meat of the discussion, starting already in so six minutes uh, framework, uh, background uh, discussion of the current status of the regulatory framework of copyright content moderation. So obviously, there is not much here that we can say in six minutes other than just like very broad strokes. But I think the essential part is to understand where we are right now. And where we are right now is at the bottom end of a very complicated process that started, well, it started in 2016 with a proposal, but then we had a directive passed in May 2019. And then uh, two years later, on July 2021, we had the implementation, uh, on June, actually, 2021, we had the implementation of the directive. What happened in the meanwhile was a very complicated uh, reality where we have both the stakeholder dialogues mandated by Article 1710 on how to interpret key provisions, also relating to liability and content moderation in Article 17, that led to the EC guidance being published as a communication in uh, June, a mere working day before the implementation deadline, uh, immediately succeeded by the opinion of the Advocate General in the case uh, brought by Poland uh, challenging the validity of Article 17, especially on freedom of expression grounds. At the same time this was happening, we had uh, uh, at the horizontal level the proposal for the Digital Services Act, which you see uh, north of the line, but also very importantly, the parallel regime, the pre-existing regime of the InfoSoc Directive that many argued uh, was actually uh, already for, foreshadowing the liability regime that Article 17 tries to put forth has been interpreted. And it has been interpreted first by uh, an AG opinion, the same AG as in the Polish case in YouTube Siandu, and finally the decision, very complex decision by the Court of Justice that lays out a sort of parallel regime to Article 17 that has some similarities, but it's not quite the same. And right now, 
the European Commission has sent letters pre starting the infringement procedures versus a lot of member states for non-implementation of the directive, being that the member states were mostly waiting for, for the Commission. Uh, and uh, the judgment of the court in the Polish decision will probably come sometime in 2022. We know since yesterday that it will not come out this year because the court calendar came out. Now, this is where we are right now, but where are we regarding the current understanding of Article 17? Well, very simply, it's a very complex article. We can't go through all of it now, but it's clear now from all of these elements that I uh, just discussed, including the guidance of the European Commission, that there's a sort of normative hierarchy or where we have licensing on the one hand and user rights and freedoms or safeguards on the other hand, and you have in the middle these preventive measures that are meant to be imposed best efforts obligations on platforms, but that they are on an hierarchical inferior level to the obligations of results that relate to the user rights in Article 17.7, so the mandatory exceptions and limitations, and some of the safeguards imposed in Article 17.9. So this reality, this normative hierarchy that should shape the way the article is interpreted is uh, recognized by the European Commission Council and Parliament during the discussions, during the hearing of the Polish uh, challenge, but also they're recognized by the guidance of the Commission itself and by the AG opinion that is very clear on this point. This means then that the preventive measures cannot be applied uh, solely uh, as it was foreseen at the beginning, especially by some member states, as pre prevailing over the user rights or freedoms and safeguards that uh, are embedded in the provision in the Article 17. So how does this pan out? Well, I will not go through all these details, but the reality here is for there to be a prevalence of Article 17, 7 and 9 over the obligations of best efforts to impose certain filtering measures or certain preventive measures, including notice and stay down, notice and take down, and preventive filtering. There has to be a nuanced interpretation of the best efforts obligation. This is what the guidance says. But also, it's clear that there have to be some sort of ex ante safeguards. And the question is how to take care of this. And I think here we have to look at two elements, both the guidance and the, what the AG opinion made of it. And the guidance, made, what the guidance basically says, well, for this to make any sense and to be compatible with EU law, including freedom of expression concerns, we have to limit the possibility of automated filtering to two types categories of content. One that is manifestly infringing content and one that is earmarked content, which is an invention of the guidance. And this is a bit complicated because earmarked content does not necessarily or mostly overlap with manifestly infringing content. It's a category of content that's about high risk of economic harm, that is time sensitive, and there's a number of requirements imposed on it, but leaves a lot of it to the rights holders, to delegates a lot of this decision to rights holders that can then impose that choice on the platforms that have strong incentives to immediately impose preventive filtering measures regarding that content. Now, the AG opinion that comes after this uh, actually is very clear within, in a postscript so after stating the AG states, rather, uh, you can see that he's not very, very happy with this, that he wrote the whole opinion before the ECD guidance came out and has to add this postscript to reassess it a little bit. But you read the opinion and what's clear from the AG's view is first that indeed you can apply this to manifestly infringing content only, but his definition of manifestly infringing content is stricter than that proposed in the EC guidance, less fuzzy, I would say. And also very clearly, it is not acceptable to apply ex ante filtering measures to earmark content, especially in light of freedom of expression and considering the precedents in CGU case law, especially the Facebook Austria case. Now, this reality leaves us clearly with a sort of bifurcated online world for platforms, where if you're not qualified as a platform as an OCSSP, you follow the previous regime of the InfoSoft directive the e-commerce directive that will be replaced by the DSA and the ruling in YouTube Seattle, especially as regards content moderation. If you qualify as an OCSSP under the new directive, you follow a slightly different or quite different regime regarding direct liability, obligations of licensing, obligations of best efforts regarding preventive measures. And you have to articulate those in this reality as was explained before. So we have this two tiered regime depending on how you qualify. In addition to that, you have to take into consideration 
that there is this multidimensional element because a lot of the provisions that are in the DSA might apply to both OCSSPs and non-OCSSPs. So this creates an additional tier of complexity about the legal regime. And this is so because very simply, OCSSPs are so for copyright content, but they also qualify as online platforms and depending on the size as VLOPs. That will mean that, at least in our view, a lot of the obligations that are not lex specialis under Article 17 will apply to OCSSPs even for the copyright content that they moderate. And so this is like the very complex background against which a lot of the discussion that we're going to have today is going to play out. And so I just want you to have this in mind, this complex reality, not to add even more, more complexity to our discussion to know that this is a multi-level uh, complex reality that takes into consideration that platforms are subject to Article 17. They are also subject to the pre-existing regime if they don't qualify as OCSP, OCSSPs. And in addition, they have content moderation obligations and some liability rules that apply to them as a function of the Digital Services Act. And now with that in mind, uh, I pass the baton to Peter that will discuss how the national legislators with this pressure from the commission uh, and from the court are deciding to implement uh, their national laws. So, Peter. Thank you, Joao, for this introduction and uh, thanks for uh, having a chance to introduce our uh, part of the VP6 research here. Let me start sharing my presentation as well. Uh, before doing so, okay, it's almost done. Uh, before doing so, here is just a very, oh, sorry, very short disclaimer. Uh, we are going to have this panel one focusing on the national experiences related to the implementation of Article 17, but it's, separ it's uh, separated into multiple parts. In the first part, you will hear a very short summary of what we have done in uh, VP6. Under we, I mean the University of Seged team involving uh, very much Joe as well uh, from uh, Amsterdam. After that, you will hear three status reports from three wonderful uh, speakers coming from Italy, Sweden, and uh, Germany. After that, we are going to focus on uh, hopefully three sub questions also uh, covered by our first phase questionnaire. After that, we hope to uh, save some time uh, for one, two, three questions, depending upon the audience's interest in uh, talking to us about our uh, findings. Without further ado, let's start uh, this uh, panel with a very short presentation on our uh, comparative uh, research. It is just a very basic summary of uh, how did we do this uh, comparative uh, research? Uh, and very importantly, the first phase questionnaire of our research. Uh, just basic information, we have planned and drafted the questionnaire last year and uh, uh, 10 member states uh, were selected to contribute to our research, including smaller and bigger uh, countries as well. Uh, four of them, uh, four of these countries are involved in this uh, round table. People had the chance uh, to fill out the questionnaire throughout two months at the end of the last year and beginning of this year. And we also saved some time for updates and, and amendments to the national reports. But very importantly, the last date when the national reports uh, were submitted is uh, around the middle of April 2021. So whatever you are going to hear today is uh, relevant for uh, or relevant with that uh, deadline. Very importantly, I might put it here, we are going to run a second phase questionnaire very soon. And uh, that is going to take place most probably in the first few months of next year. We practically need a little bit more countries to implement Article 17 in order to have meaningful data. About the first phase questionnaire, I must stress that we have focused our questions around four different questions. The first group of questions are related to hosting service providers as users. As such, we were looking for the definition of hosting service providers uh, by the um, national uh, legislation. We also focused on good faith hosting service providers, direct liability under civil law or uh, other types of, uh, of uh, uh, legal provisions. You might see a visualized uh, uh, image about uh, the answer of the national respondents on this. Very importantly, we see a mixture of uh, solutions. Some uh, people uh, reported that their countries have liability uh, standards for good faith hosting service providers. Others said no to this question. And again, other people confirmed there is some kind of liability with very strong safe harbors under the e-commerce directive. As such, we have spotted significant uh, divergence in this field. We also focused on uh, the 
pre-CDSM status quo of direct licensing of user uploaded contents. And we have uh, spotted that uh, only a very tiny uh, segment of countries had anything else than direct licensing uh, methods. The second group of questions focused on hosting service providers as intermediaries. We have raised questions related to injunctions, indirect liability, content moderation, as well as safe harbors. Again, related to the question of indirect liability, we have seen a huge divergence in the answers of the uh, member states, uh, sorry, content moderation uh, that's visualized over there. It's very interesting that some countries confirmed there are purely statutory provisions on this question. Some people confirm there, are, there is a mixture of statutory and case law provisions on this uh, issue. Some said duty of care applies, some said mainly self-regulatory, and others said mix of statutory and self-regulatory, and even some countries reported there is nothing like an obligation for content moderation. As such, the CDSM directive enters a landscape uh, which is totally uh, uh, broad and totally different with respect to only 10 countries that we covered here. The third category of questions were focused on end users. We were questioning whether end users are directly liable for uploading contents. Interestingly enough, the answer was 100% yes, but national reporters also confirmed there is no, almost no case law related to this. Very interesting. We also questioned whether member states have already implemented the uh, limitations and the exceptions mentioned in Article 17, Paragraph 7. Interestingly enough, uh, the majority of countries had already implemented both of the two categories, but we have uh, exceptions like, for example, my country, we have never had any parity exception before. We only have that since uh, the CDSM implementation. We also focused on whether limitations and exceptions are treated as defensive, subjective rights, affirmative rights, very interesting uh, outcomes on this field as well. Something else as a uh, final part of this uh, group of questions, um, national reporters confirmed that 70% of these countries had nothing like a complaint and redress mechanism before the CDSM uh, implementation took place or could took place. So the CDSM brings a totally new regime for the majority of the countries with respect to this uh, question. And finally, we had one single question where we asked uh, the reporters to update us on the status of the implementation of Article 17 in their countries. Uh, again, this is uh, a status from around February to April of uh, this year. Very interestingly, the majority of the countries have taken steps in this field. Only Estonia had done virtually uh, nothing in this field, field. But nevertheless, at that time, only a minority of countries had an implementation. This is probably the point where we can turn uh, to our uh, national speakers uh, for the first time, as uh, uh, we, they are here to help us to understand the current status of the implementation of, of Article 17. If you don't mind, I am uh, asking uh, you in uh, your uh, order of, in, in the alphabetic order of your name. So Helena, you should probably the, uh, be the first uh, from Germany. So before doing so, one single uh, language, Hungary has already implemented Article 17, and uh, uh, this uh, has come into force uh, six days before the official deadline of the CDSM. So at least in one aspect, Hungary was a good guy in the European Union. Uh, but now at this point, I pass the word to Helena, and then uh, Julia, you should continue, and then Kasper should be the third one. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, so. Uh, to give you an overview over the German implementation of Article 17, um, I would like to start out with a uh, with taking a step back and looking at what happened before. Um, since in my eyes, it it gives a certain outset to how Germany um, took this on. Um, we have to remember that in 2019 there were these big prote protests in Germany um, against the, the directive back then, and in, on this background, the uh, German government um, had this declaration in the council document in April, um, and they said the aim must be to make the upload filter instrument largely superfluous. So whatever they did later in transposition was also um, keeping that aim in mind. Let's have a look at the timeline. Um, it looks quite complicated and long. Um, the whole thing took um, more than a year since the first draft to the finally enacted law. 
um, in the very beginning, the, um, the first discussion draft from January 2020 was not yet about Article 17, that was only in June 2020. Um, and uh, with the enactment in May, um, in the end of May, um, then the German government made sure to enact it before uh, the end of the transp transposition deadline. Um, the law entered into force in the beginning of August 2021 of this year. So let's have a look at these uh, discussion drafts. I would like to give you a short overview of how this all in evolved and in how far maybe also the German government took um, or had in mind this uh, aim that they stated beforehand. We have the uh, first discussion draft in June 2020. Um, there we still, um, this was the first time that um, uh, this uh, new law was introduced. It is called um, the URDAG right now. It's uh, in German, uh, the whole thing would be Urheberrechtsdienstanbietergesetz. So it's a, it's a one whole statute only for Article 17, which was in the end um, enacted. So um, two interesting things that are um, deviating also from, or like concre concretizing maybe some of the aspects of the, of the directive. And um, yeah, let's say to, to um, define some of the safeguards that we might need um, in order to enact uh, this directive uh, legally um, and in, in line with the fundamental rights. Um, there were two in this first draft already in Germany. Um, the one was um, an exception for automatically verifi verifiable snippets. Um, that means that um, short, very short parts of video, audio, text or um, images, graphics, um, are not to be filtered because they're automatically exempted. Um, it was back then, it was 20 seconds, seconds of video for or audio, 1000 characters for text and 250 kilobytes in image or graphic. And the other thing that was also probably widely um, discussed maybe also throughout Europe was the pre-flagging idea. That means that uh, users could label the works as not copyright infringing um, with the upload and in this case like in with the first draft it was still the the idea that this content is then exempted from first screening at all so it, it is not screened at all um however as you can see on this timeline there were many um public consultations and they had did they did have a certain effect so when we look at the second draft um already this this pre-flagging mechanism um is not as extensive here as it was envisaged in in the in the first draft um, here we introduced a pre-check procedure, so that means that all videos are automatically screened um, and with the justification that otherwise obviously it would not be possible to determine whether a corresponding blocking request exists at all. And in the third draft, um, which is the, the final one but that was also um, in the end almost verbatim um, uh, enacted, um, we have now a new situation again. Um, we have some content that is um, considered as presumably allowed. Um, and that is that combines basically the two ideas of, uh, of snippets and of uh, pre-flagging. Uh, but now it is limited to content that is first, um, um, that contains less than half of the copyrighted work. And second, it also has to combine it with other content. And only then we come to the third step, uh, which means that it should be then, if, if it um, kind of came over the th first two, um, two uh, prerequisites, then it can be either flagged as uh, non-infringing by the user, or it is a case of marginal use, which would be then the what we had before as snippets. Um, however, also the marginal use was cut down to uh, lower numbers. So we have now only 15 seconds um, 160 characters instead of 1000 and instead of 250 kilobytes, we have only 125 uh, kilobytes per photographic work. So this was um, how the, the directive was finally implemented now. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, it's uh, in force since the 1st of August. And with this, I give on the word to Julia. Thank you so much. Hope you can hear me. Uh, and thanks everyone, Peter, Joao, for the invitation. It's really nice to be back on uh, Recreating Euros uh, venue and discussions. Uh, 
Um, it's very timely and very interesting to present to you the Italian scenario. I will wrap it up very quickly for you, not only because um, the, the official final draft of the implementation decree of the uh, CDSM directive just uh, passed and, and was officially adopted uh, roughly two weeks ago on November 4th. But it's also very interesting to present right after Elena, I was just thinking, because Article 17, as opposed to what Elena just presented for Germany, has been way less the protagonist in the Italian debate on the CDSM uh, directive. So let me just present to you very briefly, and I, I value the, the time we have for discussions so I will probably skip some important details, but I, I hope you, you will uh, forgive me. So as I said, the, the official draft of the implementation decree now is, uh, I mean, now stands as the, the implementation and the law that we will have in Italy. Uh, it's, you will not find it yet in the website of the official journal of Italy, but we are expecting it to be published anytime soon. In any case, this decree, um, substantially and almost completely uh, relies and reflects the draft that was put forward by the government back in August. So um, for those of you who read or engaged with the, with the commentary or the text uh, of that draft, especially when it comes to Article 17, um, rest assured that, uh, that there hasn't been substantial uh, modifications on that. So the the implementation process was also quite uh, hard and long, but uh, in, um, in, in putting forward a draft, uh, a draft, first draft by the government and discussing it and expecting the opinion by both, um, by both chambers of the Italian government, uh, of the Italian parliament, the government was was quite relying on a positive approval of this draft because it was already a very mature draft. It was already very, um, very uh, technical and detailed, and that what uh, that's what exactly what uh, what happened. So uh, these two favorable opinions came in. Uh, the the debate around the. Uh, CDSM uh, directives and the new provisions that we will embrace in the uh, Italian uh, Copyright Act uh, has been extremely lively. So even before the parliament uh, was running the, the consultations for drafting the, the opinions, and the debate has been characterized by three main aspects. So not only within academic circles, but also beyond uh, academia in the public debate, the, the main points discussed were, and, and also on which the debate really inflamed, were basically three. So the first one was the enhanced protection of um, artists and performers. This has to be located within a, an idea of the, the liberalization of collecting society and collective management of copyrights in Italy is still very much ongoing and somehow is, is still quite hard use. So, so we have new collecting societies in Italy who are trying to, to build new business models for collecting management of rights and that's a sensitive topic. The second topic on which the debate was really dominant was Article 15, because that's the provision on uh, which most significantly diverges in the Italian implementation from the wording of the directive. And the third, but very relevant for the discussion today, the new role that apparently this implementation, these new copyright rules in Italy, give the new role and power, I would say, that these new rules give to the Italian authority for safeguards in communication. So that's what in Italy is called AGICOM. Uh, some, some translated the Italian media authority or communications authority, but it, it seems to have an important role and that's luckily also subject to debate, also in terms of financial. So the, the reports by the, the parliament, if you have the chance to go through them or, or to have it translated, um, they focus on sometimes also on the financial support of this authority to carry out all the activities that now are is requested to do so very briefly on article 17 as i said it's very different from what we just heard article 70 basically it's a slavish copy and paste from the wording of the directive we have obviously now multiple provisions 
because the Article 17 being so long was basically divided in multiple new norms in the Italian Copyright Act. Um, it obliges uh, OCSSP to obtain authorization from right holders, as, the, as we all know, and makes them liable for copyright infringement by users' uploads. The only thing that I can say from, the, from an Italian perspective is that uh, together with the debate on how to translate best efforts, which um, has been, uh, I mean, very lively, but ultimately resulted in taking the Italian translation of the directive, uh, also reference to high standard of professional diligence has been included. So that's something probably we can, I can elaborate more on or we can discuss together in the discussion. And I think my time is up. So for the time being in Italy, I think that's the overview. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, for inviting me to this event. It's great also to be back and, and uh, talk uh, at the European Fora. Uh, so of course I will uh, briefly just summarize what's going on in Sweden. <clears throat> and I should probably start with a remark that, uh, that uh, Sweden is uh, making best efforts to, uh, to implement this directive uh, correctly the first time. Uh, in uh, early October uh, this year, uh, the Ministry of uh, Justice published a, a well, proposal or a draft proposal for implementing the entire directive, including, of course, Article 17. So the cogwheels are, are starting to work in the system right now. Of course, there's been a lot of work uh, during the, the, the previous years. There was a special working group set up for this purpose, but now we're seeing concrete results. And I think everything is, is starting. There's some benefits, of course, with, with what we have as a, as a uh, point of reference, because uh, publishing this proposal so late means that the, the ministry and then later the government is, is able to consider both the commission's guidance and the AG opinion in the Poland case, uh, as well as the YouTube Cyanido case uh, as well. And that is exactly what comes to expression in, in this uh, 400 long document where, where they uh, state that, well, on the one hand, uh, we want to mirror the directive or at least when it comes to article 17 as as much as we can but there's also these other sources which are of relevance that we really want to uh, take under consideration and there's a few other points here that we also have to make our own assessment to to make the uh, system work you know sweden has a, a, a certain regulation uh, from from previous years that does align a little bit with what's going on in article 17 and not exactly in the same way but we have some points of references for that too so i think a lot of or the main challenge is also how to make that work uh, given what we already have i i don't want to compare it exactly in the same sense but there is a little bit of work to try to to make the system work so yes we are we are of course late um, in this work but but as i mentioned we're trying to to make it uh, correctly the first time and uh, the, this, is a, this is the first step in this process. So what's happening right now is that there's a consultation procedure on the basis of this uh, proposal with a deadline in, I think it's 13th of December. Uh, and then it goes back to the government that will uh, work on it. And if I'm optimistic, I think we can expect an actual uh, bill uh, maybe around uh, late uh, spring if i'm uh, if we're really lucky here so winter is coming we're all going to sit down and and uh, ponder about these things so so we will have an end product uh, very very soon uh, i am uh, I, mean, I think i can finish here and we can go into the details uh, during the actual discussion thank you Uh, so judging from Peter's image, it might have frozen the connection. <laughs> so I'm going to jump in as a, because uh, that's not Peter's normal facial expression. I think he was just intimidated by Casper saying that it only comes in late spring. You're back, Peter. So so go for it. I think your oh, mic is, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. This has never happened to me in my office with Wi-Fi. I don't know what really happened. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, thank you all. I didn't know. I don't know where uh, my, my talk has ended for you guys. Anyway, as uh, I still didn't see questions in the chat forum, I believe we will be able to continue uh, exactly as we planned. We have three questions for the national reporters. Um, three questions from the, uh, from the first phase uh, questionnaire. But of course, it's a little bit of strange how I can sum up my 
questions here. We have some countries with implementation and some countries with plans or accepted proposals, etc. Nevertheless, my questions are standing for you in, this, in the following way. Uh, I will raise a question and please let me know what was the pre-CDSM situation and of course what might be the future depending upon what ever happened in your country or what will happen in your country. The first question is related to good faith uh, hosting service providers. Is there any liability in your country? Uh, was there any liability in your country in the pre-CDSM uh, situation or will this change in the future? Very shortly in Hungary, we won't change that much. We had uh, liability there with very strong e-commerce uh, safe harbors. Um, Helena, again, please, could you please tell us something about Germany? Yeah, thanks. Um, so in Germany, we did have a kind of liability. However, um, like I think we we have to divide to to divide here between direct liability and indirect liability. Maybe actually, it's not exactly the wording that we use in Germany. We use the one of uh, perpetrator liability and interferer liability to say so. So in Germany, it's Täterhaftung and Störerhaftung. Um, and um, only perpetrator liability can you can lead to to damages. Or actually, we had this before the enactment, of course. Um, and um, and Störerhaftung or interferer liability, it's more uh, liability for a, a breach of a duty of care. So in that case, we don't have um, um, any anything any damages to be paid, but we have only the obligation to refrain from future infringements. So it's rather cease and desist. So uh, what we did have was this um, notice and take down regime. Um, in some, to some extent, also notice and, and stay down regime. Um, however, um, we didn't have this direct liability that we have now with the with Article 17 of the DSM directive. Um, since now, um, after implementation, we have all like this um, um, Article 17 um, paragraph one was actually adopted almost verbatim instead of other parts of Article 17. And here we have um, it, it holds that. Um, um, every time that users upload content to an OC SSP platform, um, that is an, their own act of communication. So that would mean that they are directly liability. And that is a certain change in, in German law, actually. I, I can briefly tell you if we follow the same order. In Italy, uh, good faith, bad faith in the within the regulation of ISP liability hasn't been a, a clear-cut divide. So as you mentioned for Hungary, we strongly, I mean, we used to strongly rely on the implementation of the e-commerce directive. So that's that was the, the lighthouse. All, although I also have to add that the case law on ISP liability is quite interesting in this scenario, because if we look specifically on hosting providers, we see that there, there has been all, always a margin of different interpretation of how the rules were approaching them in case of unawareness of uh, the copyright infringement. So uh, despite the bulky, quite bulky uh, amount of case law we have, uh, the active and passive and the good faith, bad faith, even though this terminology is nowhere to be found, uh, has been always a matter of heated discussion, even uh, uh, across national courts. So what is expected is that if uh, we already saw kind of in a blurry way a trend towards considering hosting providers more towards a direct liability and more towards an active role with exceptions in the case law, but that seemed to be the trend. Now with the implementation of Article 17, using the same words that Article 17 suggests in the directive, um, this tendency probably will be even stronger. And we will see also how it will play out in the Italian case law. Uh, when it comes to Sweden, it's uh, what has been uh, the case before, and of course uh, is still right now, is a little bit of a gray area uh, liability of, of uh, intermediaries, good faith intermediaries, bad faith, it's, it, there's no difference there really. Um, has been an issue that has come up several times uh, during the last 20 years uh, during implementation of the e-commerce directive and, and also another a number of other uh, um, directives and, and own initiative legislation, um, there's been this hesitation to do that, uh, to, to just to flatly lay out that uh, intermediaries should be liable for, for, for the 
uh, different activities that are carried out. However, this cannot be precluded. So the e-commerce uh, safe harbor provisions were even formulated in a way that uh, financial uh, compensation is uh, ex uh, removed and through the safe harbor liability. However, uh, it can extend over or uh, liability can extend in so far as issuing injunctions is concerned. So it's always been possible to ask for an injunction uh, against an intermediary, which in Sweden for copyright uh, purposes is possible if you can prove, uh, uh, well, either direct infringement or contributory infringement. So there has been an opening uh, for, for approaching intermediaries as such. And in the early days, the, there's not really any cases of, of relevance, but I think a few years ago, there's been a, through a, through a uh, applet port, a very generous definition of, of contributory liability in a civil law case, uh, which essentially has made it possible to go against uh, intermediaries. Uh, so this has opened, I think, more transparently. And I'm kind of leaning, or this is what I did in my contribution to, I'm leaning to, to an assessment that you cannot preclude liabilities of intermediaries as such. Uh, if, if the task is to, to prevent uh, uh, the availability of content, that opportunity has existed as such at the cost of, of finding a, a intermediary liable. That's, uh, that's one aspect. Now, a lot of cases have also been uh, uh, concerning uh, criminal law uh, infringement, which is possible in Sweden too. This is a slightly more higher standard, of course, and the e-commerce uh, act does not uh, apply to, the safe harbors do not apply to criminal activities. So it's always been possible to, to uh, find liability in criminal law uh, if there is uh, uh, that higher standard of intentional uh, uh, act. That has not really happened to the same extent. There's, of course, a private case, but it's, uh, that's, uh, that's rather old with regards to, to the, what we know about the exclusive rights today. Now, there is another framework, too, that I briefly hinted at uh, that was adopted as early as 98, uh, which I would say is really good legislation uh, because it was a time that we were thinking a little bit like like in broad terms, not trying to regulate too much and leaving a lot of flexibility to different actors. It's called the BBS Act. Um, and it was adopted to, to uh, try to have some kind of platform regulation in the early days. So you could call it maybe a mini Article 17, uh, leaving a lot of space for reasonable assessments. It's what it requires is of service providers to not go into too much details here, but essentially what it requires of service providers is to essentially take action and to uh, remove content that may be infringing. But it is not formulated as a, as a general monitoring obligation or anything like that. Rather, it is uh, related to very obvious cases when information is provided uh, by a party and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's very similar to what we can read in Article 17 on a principle level, but it leaves a lot of opening uh, for the actors and it even does include uh, uh, the preparatory works on this, do, do include uh, uh, or consider situations where there are much bigger intermediaries like hosting providers, we would call them today, the, such as the OSSSPs, uh, which host a lot of data. There's even a statement in the preparatory works back from 98 that uh, these bigger services, yes, there would be an expectation to, to uh, have more interest in overseeing what is going on in the network or what is going on on the service, but there is not, not as such a duty to act positively. So it has been operating within Article 15, I think. Uh, that was the assessment that was made when the, that e-commerce directive was, was uh, uh, implemented too. And that framework continues to exist today. It is uh, uh, set in the context of criminal liability too. Uh, however, there are special provisions in it that give precedence to, to the copyright enforcement provision. So if it's possible to to secure uh, rights through copyright law, that is a preference that is given. So it hasn't been used uh, 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 in, the, in, uh, in recent years uh, for copyright purposes uh, as such. Uh, that is the case now. Now, of course, as I mentioned, it's, uh, the work is still ongoing in Sweden for what is to come. I can just briefly mention that in this, uh, in this proposal from the Ministry of Justice, um, the, you can sense a very high hesitation not to regulate too much when it comes to liability either. They are accepting that this is a little bit of a gray area, but they are saying that, well, if we now must 
assume that the services are liable for for uh, for what is going on on the service when uploads are taking place um it does not really change the situation too much and we don't want to impose a specific provision in the act uh, to because it might create the impression of being absolute in scope uh, and give the impression of being something that it is not so so they are really approaching this component also rather carefully i would say i will uh, finish up here then thank you Kasper, and thank you all uh, as we all want to respect the schedule of the program, I would say I skip my own uh, last two questions. Nevertheless, we have questions in the chat forum, which we should focus on uh, shortly. If I hope you had a chance to look at the chat uh, before, we have two questions, one coming from Sebastian, our VP6 uh, colleague, and the other from uh, Diane Hammer, if I pronounce your name correctly, sorry. Let's start with this one, because that was the first which is asking about the possible differences uh, between the national implementation uh, outcomes. And the real question here is, what do we think whether OSP, OS, OCSSPs will comply with the various different regimes and will not, whether it will not be lead or will not lead to any confusion and chaos? Is there anyone who wants to answer this question? I personally can only say everything depends upon what we mean under chaos and confusion, because there will certainly be something out there. I see Julia has uh, unmuted I, I would, yeah, I would quickly, if, if my colleagues don't mind, uh, take the chance of, of spending a few words because um, I, when I read the question, I had two things in mind. One is uh, to highlight how the same implementation of this new rule, which is still ongoing in some, in some member states, seem to, to, to be quite a creative moment for our national uh, copyright legislation. Let's say, for example, the parody exception. Peter highlighted in Hungary, there is no uh, such an exception in the legislation, same in Italy, even though case law obviously relates to the parody exception and includes it somehow drawing some analogies. So right now, the parody exception in the case of the implementation in Italy of Article 17 is mentioned when it comes to Article 17 scope. So, and, and I don't know if it's the case in Hungary, but that's definitely a, an element of convergence towards a model of implementation of the parody exception, obviously also in the offline world, which Italy diverged, used to diverge from, but right now in the online world is going towards some more effective harmonization in Europe. The second thing I wanted to mention is obviously I see the risk of chaos. We are highlighting here a lot of differences, not only in the legislation, but also in the approach and debate around it. Um, but for example, I don't exclude that what I was mentioning before, AGICOM, the Italian Authority for Communication, having now a role in monitoring the situation, but also kind of uh, some power of decision making on how to uh, adjust the infrastructure of the law uh, with regards to copyright infringement online. Now, I don't, I don't exclude that since this authority in Italy has now two years time to draw uh, conclusions from how the implementation of Article 17 is playing out in Italy and then report back to Parliament, I would be happy and I don't exclude that this authority will look also at European and other European national experiences before drawing conclusion and maybe adjusting a little bit the, the, the rules and operations, especially when it comes to notice and take down procedure, especially when it comes to uh, redress mechanism for end users. So, so I would address the question as probably there is room also to avoid or prevent or even solve some of the chaos we are facing today. But I see that Casper has also the hand uh, up, so I leave time for the others. Uh, thank you, Julia. I mean, I really uh, uh, align with what you say. I, this is going to cause various problems anywhere, both with regards to the exceptions as well as to the redress uh, mechanism as well that might be formulated in, in different ways. Uh, I just wanted to add one aspect with regards to the core liability uh, uh, obligation or liability aspect that might cause some trouble here too, depending on how that's implemented. And to just draw the example of what the, they are proposing in Sweden is that the, 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 the main uh, uh, obligation then to, to uh, prevent or, or, or uh, control access uh, is 
intended to be limited to the making available rights, so only to to uh, uh, transmission. Uh, so tr live transmissions are excluded completely from from the proposal here. Uh, if you're if you're going to record stuff live, let's say on YouTube, then uh, then that is not going to fall within this uh, regime as proposed by the Ministry of Justice. Only the making available right. If this uh, is not going to be in other countries, then we also have uh, differences into the main regime too. And I think uh, we'll see what happens whether the government will accept this uh, through their main proposal. But it's uh, I think that's a well very reasonable uh, aspect actually. I'll finish here then, so so we can move on. Thanks. And then one minute yet, and then we conclude. Very short remark, maybe from, from the German side, I have to say something to this because the German was one of the uh, first implementations and it was one deviating the most from the from the directive. Um, in, it, like others then um, did transpose it almost verbatim, the Germans did not. So um, this was one thing that was also discussed, not so widely on a German national level as it was discussed uh, on a European level, let's say. Um, however, in the end, the German government obviously decided to still do it like this. Um, what I what I see now, especially after we have the guidance and the and the um, opinion by by the uh, Advocate General, and the same will be true after we have finally the the judgment, is that. Um, well, the German the German transposition might be closer to what finally should come out of this, maybe, but maybe also not. And and there are so many ways that that could be that this directive can be transposed. Um, that in the end, I think we it will lead to a certain divergence. Um, and I'm I'm very just very curious how how this will come out. So um, yeah, I'll I I can in a certain way agree to this doubt. Let's say. Thank you all. Uh, according to my own uh, watch, I see that we are running out of the 40 minutes here. So, Sebastian, we won't be able to answer your question uh, in verse, but I would like to ask all my colleagues to type in their quick reflections on this question. I give you the Hungarian reflection, which is very short. No, uh, we have not discussed that during the preparatory uh, phase of this uh, of this question. Uh, with this uh, note, I finish and conclude panel one and pass the word back to Joao, and I hope our panel too will be also wonderful here. Thank you very much, Peter. And I, my, my task here is to just pass the mic to, to Sebastian. So Sebastian, take it away. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the second panel. Uh, following up on this really interesting uh, first panel with a discussion, and I hope also that in the discussion, our panel, we might uh, be able to relate back to some of the points of the national implementation. Uh, my name is Sebastian Schwemer, and I'm very happy to have with me uh, Thomas Ries, who's a professor at the University of Copenhagen, and Julia Reda, who most of you might know, but uh, she's head of the Control Copyright Project at the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte. Um, and what we are looking at in uh, this uh, panel is... Um, what's to come in EU copyright content moderation. So looking a little forward as to um, what's next, uh, what is open, what is still unanswered. And what I'm going to try now with the first five minutes is really just uh, provide one way, uh, one framework, one way of thinking of how to measure the impact and access to culture um, and reflect on the future of regulation in this context. Um, so what we're interested in is really kind of this normative assessment of the impact on the creation and access to culture by these large scale online content moderation, copyright content moderation systems. Um, and there are several important or interesting angles that could be taken in this. So we can talk about value-based norms uh, and the fundamental rights balance of copyright. So creation versus access. Fundamental rights, of course, in general, um, are really relevant in this context. Uh, fundamental rights, freedom of expression, freedom of information, freedom of the arts, freedom to conduct a business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, privacy protection, of course, uh, is, is of interest in this, in this context. A second angle that is also quite relevant is, um, since we've spoken about the implementation of the law in the first panel, is this modality of law and interaction. So state-enacted law on the one hand, and then uh, the private regulatory landscape on the other, where platforms really today are this important uh, gatekeeper for accessing um, culture for accessing copyright protected information. 
And maybe lastly, just as a general remark, um, when, when we do this qualitative assessment, there's of course quite a few perspectives that we can think about. So the rules versus standards, uh, predictability on the one hand versus flexibility. So the goal of having a fair result in a specific case, the question of effectiveness, the question of geographical scope, which was also touched upon already in the, in the first panel, uh, or technology and technological neutrality. Now, in any case, um, if we uh, if we uh, move on to this access to culture perspective, I think the first thing to say is access to culture is really tricky. Um, if we look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights in Article 27, it says in paragraph one that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. In paragraph two, everyone has a right to the protection um, of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which he or she is the author. Um, and uh, the, the question then remains kind of, well, but what is access to culture and, and how do we assess access to culture? Is that quantitative? Is that qualitative? How does cultural diversity come into play? Um, if you look at the treaty, there's a lot of recitals that, that mention cultural diversity, but how is this really uh, coming into play? And what's the relation to this digital single market that the copyright directive inter alia um, wanted to achieve? We should also keep in mind that this is inherent conflict with copyright law. Um, uh, in simple terms, copyright law really is um, trying to uh, exclude access to protected works for the purpose of appropriating economic value from those works. Uh, so the role of limitations and exceptions uh, is quite central uh, here. And of course, also the question of cultural bias could be interested in these automation content, uh, content moderation uh, systems um, when we talk about uh, 27 different European member states regimes uh, and potentially more if we look broader. What uh, I suggest as a way of, of um, trying to frame some of these, see, these questions and discussions is um, working with assumptions. And uh, one assumption could be that the existing copyright framework indeed um, is seen as optimal. So if we assume that the current balance in copyright law is optimal, um, that would mean that um, the moderation of infringing content is indeed not detrimental to uh, the access to culture. It means, however, also that um, errors in these content moderation decisions, well, they are detrimental to access to culture and cultural diversity. And then, of course, there's an interesting question behind all this, namely whether the copyright framework really is so optimal after all. This is, by the way, something that we've been working on for some time, um, but that has also pick, been picked up by others. Giovanni Sato, um, in the study for the European Commission, works with this error framework, uh, and also the Advocate General is looking more in, in this uh, dimension of false positives and false negatives. But if you think about the following, if we have a copyright infringing work on a platform that is taken down, so true positive, that's the left part of this, uh, of this little um, graph, um, then in fact there is maybe not so big of an issue. Um, it's the right decision to take it down because it is copyright infringing. Similarly, uh, it's the right decision if the work that is uploaded is not copyright infringing, that is not being disabled or taken down. So this is this one ax um, where indeed the problems maybe are not so many fold. But then there's this second perspective, which is, well, what if a work is not copyright infringing, but is taken down? So the false positive, a type one error in this decision. Uh, could be, for example, a work that is uh, covered by limitation exception, but nonetheless taken down. And similarly, um, what if a copyright infringing work is uploaded, but not taken down, that um, in this model at least would also then be an error and a problem for the access to culture. Now, um, what this really tells us, I think, is that both excessive and insufficient content moderation uh, will have negative uh, impact on the access to culture. And um, I think what it really presents is just um, one way of 
maybe in all this complexity on the discussion of Article 17, et cetera, to somehow compartmentalize some of the questions we're looking at. So uh, for the error analysis, this means that and the normative considerations following from that, um, one focus should be what ways to minimize these false positives primarily, and also false negatives. And these ways of mitigating mechanisms, well, they could be both ex ante or ex post mechanisms as seen in the uh, Copyright DSM Directive or in the Digital Service Act proposal. At the same time, of course, such a oversimplification means that the correct enforcement of the current legal regime is optimal for cultural diversity. And I made this little shrug uh, emoji is it? I'm not so sure. Well, if you think about a culture diverse and accessible and creative Europe, maybe we also need to look at these true positives and true negative examples and see where the copyright framework indeed is optimal or not um, for the context of online content moderation by these platforms and uh, copyright content and the access to cultures. With that, I would stop my very brief uh, initial intervention um, and head over to Thomas, who will um, talk a little more about the idea of rough justice in this context. Um, and um, Thomas, are you with us? Yes, you are. So you are free to share your screen. Thank you. I'll try to make it work. Thank you very much. Um, the starting point for my presentation is um, how we can say something uh, about the quality of the legal framework that shapes actual content moderation practices. So it's about evaluation of the legal framework. And the question is if we can make some normative statements on how to improve the legal framework. And if we shall do that, uh, we need a value-based measuring scale. So what I, I will try to focus on is to identify um, some common values in rights enforcement that we can use in such a measuring scale. And uh, the first place to look for common values is in the traditional legal perception of due process, where we, we have values such as predictability, contradiction, production and presentation of evidence, and so on. So this all sounds very good, but when it comes to intermediaries for all practical purposes, it's not possible to ensure the relatively high level of due process we know from the civil procedure. I'm not suggesting that civil procedural law um, is perfect, far from, but in civil procedural law, uh, it, it ensures an acceptable level of due process, which we also can rephrase to an acceptable level of justice. However, that level of justice cannot just like that be integrated into the systems of intermediaries, content moderation practices, because for the parties involved, it is simply too burdenful for all practical reasons. That's the reason why we need to modify our conception of justice in the context of internet platforms. And that is what I'm aiming at when I talk about rough justice. In getting to a conception of rough justice on internet platforms, two major general problems must be addressed. The first one relates to accuracy of the moderation practices. And there are basically two types of contents that are subject to content moderation. The first one is uh, illegal content and the second one is incompatible content which of course is legal content that is deemed incompatible with the intermediaries terms and conditions um, and obviously um, the optimal content moderation scheme can perfectly identify illegal and incompatible content and moderate it accordingly which means that it neither under enforce nor over enforce uh, substantive law and the terms and conditions of the intermediaries. The second general problem uh, concerns the inherent uh, privatization of justice. Privatization of justice will result when enforcement of rights is left to private parties and it can imply a distortion of the balancing of interest in substantive law. So that happens when uh, intermediaries stipulate that otherwise legal content is deemed incompatible and for that reason is not available to the users. In order to address that problem, the problem of privatization of justice, it's necessary to include a substantive norm into the concept of rough justice. And that again means that in addition to the procedural values in the measuring scale uh, for evaluating the legal framework, we also need to include substantive values of justice. <clears throat> Just looking briefly into the objectives of uh, value enforcement systems, um, 
there are three general objectives that must be taken into consideration. And the first one is efficacy, and that is stipulated one place is in the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights. Efficacy, and that includes that uh, persons whose rights and freedoms are violated has the right to an effective remedy before a tribunal. So efficacy implies firstly that there is access to justice in the sense that mechanisms for rights enforcement shall be easily available and not overly costly. And secondly, that effective remedies shall be available to redress wrongs. The second uh, objective in rights enforcement system is uh, what I've already uh, touched upon, uh, fair trial or due process. We have that various places in, in the uh, legal instruments on fundamental rights. It's a far more complex concept than efficacy and it in includes such things as consistency and predictability in rights enforcement, proportionality and symmetry between opposing parties. Finally, as the third objective is that we need a balanced use of resources in rights enforcement. And that refers to the fact that law enforcement requires resources and that the price of enforcement may be too high. So the price of enforcement shall be balanced against what I would term uh, the cost of being mistaken, where the cost of being mistaken equals the harms of non-enforcement. And if the costs of being mistaken are too high, more resources must be allocated to rights enforcement. A number of attempts to establish codes for due process or justice on the internet have been presented, and I'm going to address three such attempts. They are quite diverse in their scope and their substance, and I will argue that some parts of the codes are too ambitious in the sense that it's simply not possible to implement the principles in practice, while others parts have too low level of ambition in order to ensure an acceptable level of due process. So starting with the um, low uh, ambition is the Santa Clara principles on transparency and accountability and content moderation, which I believe must be the, the one that are used by most internet platforms. If we look into the, um, the three Santa Clara principles, numbers, notice, and appeal, they are all purely procedural principles. They do not address substantial principles. They're not very detailed and they have a limited scope. So to kind of extract the important content of the three Santa Clara principles, basically in my view at least, um, they provide a very limited degree of transparency in the moderation practices and appeal procedure. The first two points, uh, the numbers and notice, uh, relates to transparency, but it's not really um, very substantial uh, transparency that is um, achieved by that. And then as the final principle is the appeal, it's more detailed um, and more elaborated than the first two principles, numbers and notice. Um, but I would argue that what is needed in addition to the Santa Clara principles is at least a principle on much more transparency and binding substantial norms that at least within certain limits prohibits uh, platforms from taking down legal content. The second code I'm going to address is the relatively new Akita's principles on online due process. Um, and they do inc include such a substantial norm um, and that relates to human rights. Um, it's not a binding norm, but it's, it's still um, um, a norm in order to ensure um, that justice also in respect of uh, legal content that is taken down is, is kind of substantiated by that. I have not in this uh, slide um, cited all parts of the Akita's principles. They are, they are quite um, comprehensive. Um, so this is only extracts, uh, but the important one is the, the substantial principles that human rights and fundamental freedoms must be upheld everywhere. And there's a lot of um, condition relating to due process that um, due process principles should uh, apply to every decision 
that affects the users and uh, other parties. And then there is this kind of specification on what is meant by queue process. And I'm not going into uh, all parts of it, but just kind of pinpointing a few. Uh, there should be an opportunity for the parties to respond uh, and present evidence. And that should be a right to appeal to an internal panel, some other kind of um, tribunal. As to the due process principle, it must be acknowledged that um, it cannot be the full scope of ordinary due process principle. It must be due process in a modified and reduced form. So these principles uh, do not, um, um, it does not follow from the principles um, um, that how many stages in the moderation process and appeal process are needed in order to comply. So if we have a process that involves first a complaint or an automatic removal, and secondly, a possible counter notice, which works as an appeal, is that enough to comply with the principles? It's not quite clear, but I think it is. Um, but obviously there has to be significant limitations uh, on the number of pleadings that are admissible in each moderation case. Otherwise the process will be too slow and too burdensome for the parties. And that is a very distinct from the traditional understanding of due process where a large number of pleadings are admissible. And the same applies to producing and presenting um, evidence. Um, there can't be a large scope for presenting evidence in each moderation case. So the Akita's principles are quite unclear in these aspects and the principles seem to assume that the normal understanding of due process applies, uh, which obviously cannot be the case. The last quote I have um, uh, put into the slides is the um, Council of Europe, um, where a recommendation has been published it's relatively comprehensive and it goes way beyond um, content moderation of intermediaries. I'm not going into um, the details here, also the time is running relatively fast, but just pinpoint a few of the recommendations. And uh, what might be distinct for this code is that it also focuses on adequate training of staff that are involved in the content moderations. So one important point to discuss is uh, what are actually the qualifications of the humans making the decisions on the content moderation. Okay, the final slide, which I call a sketch for rough justice uh, on internet platform. I've tried to take some bits and pieces from the different codes on content moderation and adding a few more. And in this way, we, meant we may end up in a sketch for rough justice on internet platform. So I've divided the sketch into three different parts, procedural rules, substantive rules, and competences. First of all, there's a need for more transparency, also in the functioning of uh, algorithms and working conditions of humans. So the public actually can see what is going on. At the moment, nothing suggests that platforms voluntarily are willing to ensure transparency in respect of their algorithms uh, for different reasons. We also have to acknowledge that uh, the appeal process is not comparable to traditional perception of due process. We will have to accept some limitation on types of evidence, extent of evidence, number of pleadings. Um, we have to assess whether notice, counter notice and reply, is that enough to uh, ensure due process. Uh, the Akisa's principle refer to due process in all parts of the content moderation process, but the principles are not very specific on exactly what due process in content moderation implies. So there might be a need for establishing a minimum of level of minimum level of measures that can satisfy the concept of due process in content moderation. The purpose of substantive rules uh, is to limit content moderation of legal content, uh, and that is obviously content that is uh, incompatible with the terms and services. Um, it is straightforward proposal to impose an obligation on internet platforms to ensure freedoms arising from human rights. The next question is whether this obligation should be extended to other freedoms. First of all, uh, copyright exceptions and limitations. And there could be good reasons for doing that. And we have seen the first step in that direction in Article 17 of the Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market. 
However, one could doubt this obligation would be very effective if, if it's not combined with effective sanctions in case the platforms do not uh, comply. The final part on competences shall ensure quality in the content moderation system. Algorithmic content moderation involves a risk of biases, both original biases and developed biases. And to reduce the biases and ensure accuracy, there must be a certain level of human involvement. And that could be human review in appeal and furthermore random test of accuracy by human intervention. Finally, human competences must be ensured by adequate training and working conditions, as we know from the Council of Europe rec recommendation. And when it comes to working condition, I think the most essential issue is how much time is allocated to each human decision. But also in relation to human competences, we must, due to practical circumstances, accept a significant lower level compared to other forms of uh, legal decision making. So I would leave it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, so a sketch for rough justice or framework for rough justice going forward. Uh, Julia, um, quite interested in hearing your thoughts. You've been uh, following these developments for a very long time. So uh, thanks. Um, Yes, thank you, Sebastian and Thomas, for your very interesting uh, presentations of where we go from here, which is uh, quite a messy situation. And um, perhaps I will share a few thoughts uh, first on Sebastian's presentation regarding uh, the, the assumption where you already mentioned that um, it's not immediately obvious that the current uh, copyright balance is uh, optimal for access to culture. I would go uh, a step further, perhaps unsurprisingly, to this audience and say that the balance is not optimal at all. I would say the most obvious example of that is the term of copyright protection. I don't think um, anybody would be producing fewer cultural works if uh, the term of protection were, let's say, 30 years after the death of the author. Um, in fact, uh, we know that the vast majority of uh, published cultural works is only commercially available for a few uh, years after publication rather than after death of the author. So certainly there could be a more optimal um, uh, term of protection for access uh, to culture. And there is also a huge gap between the user perception of what is allowed and what is actually allowed under the copyright exceptions. So uh, I would argue that if copyright was perfectly enforced by algorithm, that wouldn't necessarily be such a desirable situation because a lot of um, the acceptance of the copyright system is based on the fact that there is a lot of tolerance for sort of minor infringements that don't do a lot of harm. Um, but uh, uh, taking a, a step further uh, from that uh, question, I really liked uh, in Sebastian's um, analysis, uh, the point that we need a framework to categorize the different errors, uh, um, not just in terms of false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, but I think we can also um, further categorize the different types of false positives because it looks from uh, the advocate general opinion in the article 17 case that uh, upload filters are not going to be banned uh, however, that uh, the requirements for their use in terms of accuracy are going to be very high if the court uh, follows the advocate general. So um, perhaps I can shed a little bit of light uh, on this further categorization because at GFF, um, we have been monitoring the implementation of the um, Article 17 under German law, and we have called upon people to um, send us the examples of problems uh, that arise in the practical application. And perhaps I will just share a few sort of learnings from that exercise. Uh, the first is, which is perhaps a bit surprising, that it seems that only YouTube uh, in Germany has actually taken active steps of changing uh, the system that they had in place in four in terms of the use of upload filters. So this raises the question of the definition of uh, OCSSPs, which platforms are actually covered. It seems that at the moment, a lot of platforms are taking the view that they are not covered. And um, YouTube seems to be the only one that is sort of actively saying, well, this law was obviously designed for us. And so they have actually introduced a pre-flagging system and these kinds of things where uh, it's visible 
um, that they have actually cha made changes in reaction to the law. And it also looks like the, these uh, flagging options are actually available globally, which perhaps answers a little bit the question of, uh, are there going to be problems with the cross-border application? So my prediction is that um, uh, the Court of Justice, if it follows more or less what uh, the Advocate General says, is going to more or less say, not only is the German implementation of Article 17 compatible with EU law, but it's actually a requirement for member states to do it more or less like this. Then at the same time, you have the, the big platforms that don't want to implement 27 different uh, applications because it's quite costly. So I think there is going to be a pressure um, basically for platforms to implement more or less the German version in all the member states that have a verbatim implementation. Um, so regarding the, the notices that we have received of problems with upload filters, we have identified sort of four categories of mistakes or problems. One is um, where the algorithm simply seems to make a mistake. So for example, we had things like uh, somebody um, uploads a video of uh, the moon that they have made themselves to uh, a platform and like they've made the, the recording the day before and then the upload filter says this contains content by Sony Music or something like this. So there, it just seems to be a mistake because there isn't even, um, like a human can't even tell why this uh, uh, upload filter has found the match. I would say that minimum thresholds to some extent help with that because of course, if platforms are required to find very short extracts uh, of matches, then of course the error rates are going to be much higher. Um, the second part is uh, resulting errors resulting from copyright exceptions. There, I hope that uh, the, the um, European Court of Justice ruling is going to help because the Advocate General says that basically transformative uses should be excluded because they're not manifestly infringing. So in that respect, I would say even the German implementation doesn't go far enough because it has a relatively narrow um, interpretation of what is a transformative use. Um, the third and probably the most frequent we have seen is uh, errors resulting from false claims of exclusive rights. And uh, there you have different kinds. So it could be that somebody simply is fraudulent and is saying, I have rights in, in this content, um, usually actually with the intention of getting uh, the monetization from videos. So it's not even blocking in most of those cases if it's fraudulent, but it's actually uh, about money, about uh, the monetization. But there are also false claims that look like they're a mistake. So this happens uh, quite often with public domain or Creative Commons content, where basically somebody is just not making the distinction between whether they have an exclusive right to use something or a non-exclusive right. And for that purpose, um, my colleague Paul Keller from um, Open Future and I have actually written a white paper where we make a proposal how platforms under Article 17 could become a bit better at protecting this public domain and Creative Commons content uh, from being wrongfully blocked. I'm just going to uh, paste that in the chat. Um, this was inspired also by the German implementation, which basically says uh, that the platforms have to ensure that the same public domain content doesn't get blocked multiple times. So this means they have to have some sort of internal database of openly licensed and public domain content. And so we are basically asking the question, well, wouldn't it be more efficient to have a shared database that all the platforms uh, feed into? And finally, the last uh, type of, of uh, problems that we have seen is bad communication within a right holder organization. So this happens also incredibly frequently that basically a band comes to us and says, we try to upload our own music, but our, I don't know, music publisher has a deal with some other company that is a distributor on different online platforms and they don't know that this is our account. And so we can't upload our own music also. Um, quite a frequent problem. So I think it's useful to have this exercise of basically trying to further categorize the types of problems that exist and then try to see what solutions um, could, uh, could work. And so there uh, I, I go to Thomas's um, analysis and I would very much echo his call for the need for sanctions. Um, for example, sanctions for false claims uh, resulting from right holders. Um, because one thing that we're also seeing is that even if you have all these safeguards in the law in terms of what platforms do, 
Some right holders also use their own copyright filters without any of those safeguards. And then they use the results of that uh, to do automated notice and takedown procedures. So there also you have to ask the question of penalties. Like, do we need some kind of sanction against um, wrongful notices against legal content? Um, also perhaps uh, looking forward, uh, uh, Thomas Ries mentioned that the Santa Clara uh, principles are not enough in terms of um, transparency and access to data. Um, there, it's also worth highlighting that the German uh, implementation does have a data access right, which I think is very important, but unfortunate, unfortunately, it's limited to researchers. So for us as a user rights organization, that means we cannot use this um, uh, data access right, for example, to gather information about the types of errors that, um, that happen. So this means we are dependent on basically people uh, actively coming to us and telling us about the problems where it would be much more efficient if as a user rights organization, we would also be able to ask data from platforms about, for example, uh, how many times has the flagging mechanism been used? How many times um, have um, things not been blocked because of the safeguards and so on? Um, so I will leave it at that. I think um, we will, we will uh, not have a lot of time for discussion, unfortunately. But these are my initial thoughts on your excellent presentations. Thank you so much, Julia. And no, unfortunately, we won't have much time for discussion today. But uh, since this is about the future, I think this is really just the starting point. And you came with some really interesting reflections, of course, both uh, looking at the copyright system, uh, I think especially this tolerance for minor infringements, which is kind of difficult to automate in, 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 the, in the regime that is set forth in Article 17, um, and the categorization of false positives, which is definitely important to for take to then look at how these can be mitigated. So this is, I think, a very useful uh, exercise that you've been, uh, been doing. Um, thanks so much for that. Now, um, if there's last questions, please write them in the chat. Otherwise, I would hand over to Thomas uh, for wrapping up uh, today's uh, webinar. And as I mentioned, I mean, this is just the starting point for further conversations. So I hope we can continue this uh, very soon. Thank you. Um, well, we are a bit behind schedule and I think that I'm the primary cause for that. So I would rather not repeat that. And um, just try to do this, not uh, prolong the, uh, the seminar um, more than is strictly necessary. The, the aim of the seminar was the first part of it to um, look into content moderation practices within the EU level uh, in the context of Article 17, and also to look at platform liability and national implementations of Article 17. And I think, if we should kind of um, extract a keyword from the first panel, it would be um, national differences. Um, and there might be a fear what that will result in. The questionnaire reveals that uh, there are significant differences between the EU member state when it comes to the legal framework surrounding intermediate content moderation. And we can also see significant discrepancies between the national um, implementations of Article 17 and therefore we may expect divergences in national case law. And also we eventually may expect case law from the Court of Justice of the EU that clarifies some of the obscurities of Article um, 17. In addition, a number of member states have not yet implemented Article 17. So um, one interesting uh, point here, I think is the, um, um, what Helena said about the situation in Germany, where there were large demonstrations um, uh, aimed at Article 17. We don't know for sure if, if there's reason to, to really fear this, but I mean, it's, it kind of points to the future that there might be some fears out there that um, should be taken seriously. Um, the second panel, um, which uh, relates to the uh, uh, potential avenues for content moderation and the balancing of competing interests and, and impact. That part of, of the webinar is uh, related to one task of the work package six, which is to provide some policy recommendation. Um, so, so the final aim relates to the, the policy oriented part of 
uh, of content moderation. And we have to say as to the normative parts on how to challenge uh, to change the legal framework surrounding content uh, moderation activities, we have some challenges is that are difficult to address when it comes to access to culture and freedoms and justice on uh, platforms. The final, I think, very important insight uh, from uh, Julia Reeder's uh, intervention is, well, first of all, the discussion of optimality of copyright protection. That's not a new, we all know that, that's not a new discussion, um, but, and, and there are different views on that. But perhaps more importantly, uh, the, the need for categorization of types of failures and mistakes in, in content moderation could be elaborated trying to find out what is really going on out there. Um, and I think that's a very valuable input that we can um, um, take uh, into our further work because this is obviously an, an ongoing uh, project. So with these few remarks, I will hand the floor back to Joao. Oh, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, we want to respect everyone's time. It's uh, we could, of course, for us, we are we're copyright nerds and intermediary liability nerds, so we'd be happy to stay here all day. But we're mindful of people's time, so we just wanted really very much to thank the speakers, especially those coming from outside the project, Elena, Casper, Julia, and of course Julia. <laughs> uh, this is super valuable we'll take all of this into consideration and also to thank the audience for your for your questions and for your participation we will make the slides available and we will also make the recording available to everyone and we will have upcoming uh, events including a discussion on this topic of content moderation from an empirical perspective where perhaps we can get into a lot of these national differences and also to the points that Julia made at the end exactly how, how can we understand and better study what's happening here and for sure we'll take those recommendations uh, to heart in our future work so with that i would say goodbye and uh, wish everyone a, a lovely day thank you very much mm -hmm.